Four years ago, I trained a new worker who was honestly a nice guy at the time. Early 30s, seemingly healthy, very much into yoga, had a beautiful girlfriend, the works. He seemed very balanced and healthy. His name was Andrew. We had another longtime co-worker who was sort of Mr. Popular with managers, but honestly, really annoying. People could only take him in small doses. He was essentially the embodiment of a TikTok frat boy who would randomly dance on the job and freestyle. Extremely annoying. Anyway, his name was Brad. Now, before I explain, I should include that this workplace sucks. It barely holds a single star on Indeed. It's a large factory with no windows, toxic management, long hours. It was very hard on most people's mental health. So anyway, roughly a year into Andrew's stay, things started to change. He and I were mutually friendly to one another. We would have long civilized discussions about interesting things, but something was really out of place when he mentioned his new beliefs about the world being flat and a hologram moon theory. It was really unlike the old version of him who was really rational. I sort of shrugged it off and said it's probably a phase or he's trolling. Fast forward a few weeks. Andrew has seemingly took a lot of interest in co-worker Brad and sort of developed some of his mannerisms, but in a more endearing way, kind of copying his silly dances and laughing. It seemed harmless, but as months go past, he continued to dance more and more, to the point he had to be asked to stop by supervisors. He would even be moving around at the morning meetings, using all the same mannerisms and phrases as Brad. This really started to creep out Brad, to the point he switched shifts. We theorized maybe he was on drugs, but Andrew was very vocal against all substance use, including alcohol and weed and such. He was also a vegan. Where things change for the worse is when Brad ends up getting with a new hire at work. She ends up becoming his girlfriend. They move in together and such. This is when Andrew shows up to work using Brad's name, even signing himself in on the logbook as him, referring to himself as Brad all morning. Then, later that day, Andrew stands up on a work table, screaming that he's in love with Brad's girlfriend, his arms spread out in a cross-Jesus formation, face to the ceiling. The whole place was silent, and after, he ended up standing in a corner with a broom, sweeping nothing for the next several hours. He would not turn around from the corner, not even when tapped on the shoulder or called by name. The only time I saw him away from that corner was when it was time to go home. He was the last one out. Unfortunately, my job being QC, I'm always among the last ones out as well. Despite both of us being the last in the building, I did my best to act normal when passing him in the hallway. I glanced at him. He was looking directly at me, head tilted down, making a pseudo-snarling dog face, eyebrows in a V, tongue and teeth out. The next day, our boss decided Andrew needed to go to the hospital, so we actually made an appointment and got him in an Uber. He was put on leave for a week. The security guards who I was friends with told me Andrew kept showing up in the middle of the night trying to sign in for work at the card reader, sometimes at 2 to 3 in the morning. Anyway, surprisingly, a week later, Andrew comes back and seems somewhat normal, almost like he has no recollection of anything he did. He even wrote an entire album on his phone in that time, which surprisingly was better than I thought it would be, but I noticed it was all love lyrics, sort of wacky country love songs. As things seemed to normalize with Andrew, he stated he really wanted to hang out with me, go for a hike and throw axes at trees and stuff like that. I sort of didn't agree or disagree and told him I'd get back to him on that, as I was secretly a bit on edge. He asked me later in the day if I was still down and I said unfortunately I had other obligations and he said, well I guess I can't throw an axe at your face then and I laughed, not knowing how to react at all. I told the manager about that, and he kind of just scratched his head uncomfortably, 
and shrugged his shoulders. Anyway, Andrew ends up finding Brad's address due to a work get-together where everyone was invited and someone leaked it to Andrew. They eventually find rocks and sticks and weird formations on their doorstep, like shrines, and we all collectively knew it was Andrew. Things got really weird when they actually found Andrew looking through their windows at night. He was also scratching the windows with his nails, calling out Brad's name, repeatedly whispering, Brad, I need to tell you something. This is when our manager finally decided to take action and fire Andrew. Four years later, Andrew still stalks Brad's now ex-girlfriend, who had to get a restraining order against him. He annually makes new Facebook accounts and adds all 200 plus workers who used to work there. He uses a new name each time with a different selfie. He sends a message to each one of us as well, saying, Hey, it's Brad from work. So I guess my question is what would this behavior be called, and how did such a normal, likable, level-headed person turn into this? Is there a term for this behavior? What would your diagnosis be? One of my friends had the balls to ask him in a reply if he recalls anything, which he doesn't seem to, but he sure remembers Brad's ex-girlfriend and says some extremely concerning things about how she's the one, and the only one. I'm the bigger one, she's the smaller one. There's a quote. He said that he was put on this earth to essentially save her. He also seemingly has no support at all from family or anything, and is working a new job, living alone unattended. I feel like this is sort of a risk. Anyway, I'm interested in some of your feedback in what he might be dealing with. This took place around 15 years ago. I would have been about 13 years old. My dad has always taken an annual fishing trip with friends that would put him out of state for about a week. I have numerous stories about weird things happening while he was gone on set fishing trips, from paranormal events to someone attempting to break into our house, but this one is the most unnerving to people when I tell it. When my dad would go on these trips, I would usually sleep in my parents' bed. My mom and I treated it like a little sleepover and would watch movies, stay up late and gossip, even on school nights. I remember falling asleep after a late night movie and being roused from sleep what felt like just minutes later. My mom is a light sleeper, while on the other hand, it takes a catastrophic level event to wake me up from a dead sleep. I remember waking up feeling as if something was wrong. The room was illuminated oddly and there was a distant rhythm I was only partially aware of. I'm half asleep. And as I open my eyes, I can see my mom on top of the bed, on her knees, peering out of the window above her bed. I started to ask, what's going on, when she turned to me quickly and shushed me. I quietly joined her looking out of the small box window that was slightly cracked open, and the distant, rhythmic chanting became more and more clear. Our house sat in front of a strip of woods. The trees aren't too thick, and you can't see through most of the wooded area. The chanting was getting louder by the second, and the odd illuminations finally made sense. You could see a line of hooded figures in dark clothes, holding torches marching east, chanting what sounded like demonic, dark things. It felt surreal and scary as we held our breath waiting to see what they would do. Were they headed towards the houses to burn them down? Were they going to attempt to break in and sacrifice us? It felt like ages that we sat there, watching this line of people walk through the woods, their torches raised high, and their chanting continuing through the night. But that was it. They just walked away. After what was probably more like two minutes, my mom and I laid back down and discussed what we saw. 
trying to get back to sleep. We told my dad first thing in the morning when he called to check in, but I remember him not believing us. He thought it had to be a dream or something. That kind of thing didn't happen in our small town in Ohio. But the next day, there was an article in the local newspaper about a lamb being slain on a makeshift altar on the east side of my town. My dad stopped doubting us, and my mom and I got even more freaked out. My parents still live in that house, and we've never seen any other cult-like behavior in the area. But that one evening freaked us out enough that I decided to permanently camp out in my parents' bedroom every time my dad left town until my late high school years. If you stuck around, I appreciate it. Thanks for listening and allowing me to get my story out there. My friends and I were reminiscing about creepy stories this weekend. This one came up, and I haven't stopped thinking about it since. So I wanted to write it down and share. I'm a security guard for an alarm response company. We answer alarms for businesses and private residences. 99% of the time, it's a motion detector set off by a cat, or a restaurant forgot to disarm their stuff before the stock truck arrived to unload. In this case, I was called out to a house where the back door alarm was set off, like it thought someone opened it. The owner was out of town, but she was alerted by her app and had her mother meet me there. We checked the door. It's locked. We figure maybe someone tried the door, but it didn't budge, setting off the alarm. But there's a light on inside. The mother mentions this to the daughter on the phone. The daughter says she isn't sure if she left the light on or not. It's a good idea to make people think someone's home, but she just isn't sure. That gave me a bad tingle. The mother wanted to go inside to check. However, she didn't have a spare key. The neighbor did, but they were asleep and the mother didn't want to wake them. So, I fill out my papers and go back to my normal patrol routes. An hour later, the same house sends an alert out. I'm the only one in my city zone, so I answer it again. When I pull up, Police and CSI are there talking to the mother and the now-awake neighbor. They are reviewing the video footage sent to them by the daughter. I look at the footage. Four armed men wearing masks and hoodies came out of the bathroom a minute after the mother and I left. They proceeded to rob the place. They'd broken in and locked the door behind them for appearances. They're the ones who turned on the light. The mother told me three guys had robbed her daughter's home a month before. Somehow, they knew when this girl would be out of town. They appeared smart, desiring a quiet robbery without conflict, but they brought guns, so they were prepared to shoot their way out of trouble if need be. The mother had wanted to go in. If she'd had a key or woken the neighbor for a key, we would likely have been shot dead by these guys when we went inside. Work doesn't give me Kevlar vests or anything. If I ever get another house call and someone is there, I'm not going inside, no matter what is asked of me. I count myself fortunate the way was blocked this time, because I was prepared to foolishly go in and check if I could. The 1% of calls where something is actually off, it has never been as bad as this one. About five years ago, I worked for a high-end kitchenware company as a floor salesperson. At the time, I was about 20 years old. I'm a female and I'm a larger woman, and I'm five foot nine. I'm also mixed indigenous, so picture thick hair. Dark features, wide build, that kind of thing. This is important for later. I'd been working at this job for a few months at this point. My boss, whose side note was a total creep, had really warmed up to me and had promoted me to keyholder within a few weeks of working. 
I'd become comfortable closing on my own and working alone too. Often I'd be working either a full day shift, which is 9.30am to 6.30pm alone, or I'd work a crossover shift where I'd overlap with someone for about an hour. Then I'd close the store alone. That shift was 4pm to 9.30pm. One evening I came in, greeted my boss. He then decided to take a smoke break for about 25 minutes within his last hour of overlap. I didn't mind, as I mentioned. The guy was a total creep. But as he was leaving, I noticed a kind of strangely behaving man pacing outside of our store. Our location was inside of a mall, so you'd see window shoppers all the time. But this guy was pacing with intention. He was wearing a large jacket, sunglasses, and a hat, so it was genuinely hard to see him. But he would occasionally lower his glasses to peer into the store. I even called out to him from behind the desk at one point, saying something like, I don't bite, come on in, in a friendly way. He shook his head and said, just looking, in a low but clear sounding voice. He backed away, leaving the storefront. I brushed it off as some random just being too nervous to come into our store. Whatever, it happens all the time. It was at this point my boss returned from his smoke break and began finishing up a couple of his end of day tasks before leaving. I mentioned to him that I accidentally scared off a nervous window shopper. We kind of laughed it off and disregarded it as nothing. But something felt weird. He was pacing for a solid 20 minutes just by the window, staring in. Again though, it's retail. I chalked it up to weirdness. After a few minutes, the phone rang and I picked up. On the other end was a guy with a low and clear voice huffing, asking about getting a gift for his girlfriend. The conversation went like this. Oh, no worries. We have a couple of options for gifts. Is she looking for knives? Dinnerware? I, uh, don't know. <sighs> she liked knives, I guess. Okay. If you're not sure what she already has, you could get her a specialty knife. Fuck. God, yeah. Oh, sorry. Just... Sorry. Specialty knives. I know I should have hung up at this point, but I continued. It's okay, uh... Yeah, so, specialty knives. We have an assortment. Some are meant for meat and fish. Others are for vegetables. Does she like to cook a lot? He proceeded to say some very sexual and derogatory things. Excuse me? I questioned him. He continued on with the extreme comments. At this point, I promptly hung up the phone, shaking and nervously looking around. My boss knew something was up and asked me what was wrong. I told him what had just happened, and he expressed his apologies, but otherwise didn't seem concerned. It clicked in my head suddenly. The guy window shopping earlier had the same voice as the guy on the call. I was petrified. I told my boss I was nearly certain it had been the guy. At that exact moment, my boss got a call from his very young girlfriend, and he had to leave 15 minutes earlier than he had planned. So, there I was, alone in the store, and stuck there for another four and a half hours. The stars were not aligning for me that evening. I ended up calling security and let them know I'd received a threatening call from a customer who I was fairly sure had been wandering them all. They stationed an officer near the store for the remainder of the evening, but I still felt entirely on edge. Every call after that I let go through to voicemail. I was too scared to answer again. I was also working at another store in the mall at the time. I called my friend there to ask if after their closing shift, if I could walk home with them, and he agreed. I quickly walked over to the other store with a security guard nearby and started to walk home with my friend from my other job. The whole time I was scanning my surroundings, getting glimpses of shadowy figures outside, and making myself anxious. Eventually I got home, 
calm myself down and try to get some rest. The next day, I had a shift at my other job with the same friend who walked me home the previous night. At one point in the afternoon, I picked up a phone call and it was the same guy. I much more quickly realized who it was and hung up a lot faster this time around, but he got as far as saying, I like this uniform better. I can see more of those curves without. Then I hung up. I told my boss at the game store about what happened, and we made an official buddy system after that. Nobody leaves alone. Ever. Luckily, we always worked in pairs, but we didn't separate until we were either at the bus stop or at home. Nothing happened after that, thankfully. It was just awful having it happen back to back like that and with no conclusion. The security guard stayed on alert for a while. I ended up speaking to other female workers in the mall, and as it turns out, there was a handful of plus-sized women getting harassing and violent phone calls for a little while, but they never caught the guy doing it. I still think about it years later. I wonder where he is and what he's doing. I never saw him again, I don't think at least. And if I did, I would have known. Anyway, thanks for listening. It feels good finally getting that off of my chest. I studied abroad in Costa Rica for about three months and all the students in this program were living with host families nearby the university. As the country is considered far safer for men, I would often walk my female classmates to their host homes after class got out. The university had several security guards patrol the neighborhood on motorcycles to make sure that we were all safe, so walking at night never felt dangerous. This particular night, I was walking two girls home, and it was completely dark out. When we were about two minutes away from the first girl's house, a car drove by with two younger local guys in it. The passenger hung his head out the window and shouted some sexual things at the girls. Unfortunately, that wasn't a unique experience for the girls due to the machismo culture, but it was a little surprising as guys generally won't say anything to girls that are with other guys. We continued walking until we were about one block away from the first house when we saw the car stop in the road in front of us. Both the passenger and the driver got out of the car and started to walk toward us. I told the girls to start walking the opposite direction while I stood there trying to figure out what I was supposed to do. There were two of them and only one of me, and at least one of the guys was keeping his hands in his pockets, potentially hiding a knife or a gun. Luckily, when the guys were only about 15 feet in front of me, and I still hadn't figured out how one dad bod having college kid was going to fight off two fit and potentially armed goons, a security motorcycle came around the corner and sped toward us. The guys ran to their car and drove off. The security guard followed us for the rest of our walk home, and he would follow us every time we walked home for the rest of the semester. I'm a 17-year-old female, working as a cashier at a popular thrift store. I've been there for approximately 8 months, and I love my job and my co-workers. The common thing I've noticed is that unfortunately, any time a new younger female cashier starts working, she will be hit on by plenty of older guys, and I was no exception to that. I've never had to deal with creepy or weird customers until this job and I worked in the food industry before, so maybe that's why. We of course get a handful of regulars, and while I've had a few creepy older guys hit on me before, there's a regular that comes in all the time. I want to say he's in his late 40s, and while he's always nice, my manager pointed out his obsession with me. I was called in the office the other day so he could show me how he acts and such with surveillance cameras. 
Here's a list of what's been pointed out to me that I didn't really notice before. He comes in at roughly the same time I'm working every day, and apparently doesn't show up on my days off. I work closing most of the time, so he comes in around 6pm. When he comes in, he will immediately look at the register I almost always work at, and will do a double take looking for me. He usually buys one bullshit item, spending about 15 minutes in the store usually. My manager has pointed out that he needs to buy something, or else he knows it'll look weird. Every time, without fail, he will go to my register, and even when I was on the floor doing recovery, he'll ask me to check him out because I'm his favorite cashier. If there's a shorter line, it doesn't matter. He will stay at my register waiting and watching me. He lingers around after buying something just to talk to me, showing me things on his phone, making sure there's no one else in line, my manager said he approaches me when I'm alone so he can talk to me without holding up a line. He's commented on my hickeys that I failed to cover up before on my neck, making weird remarks here and there. He says he usually checks because there's always about one or two. He said I would look good as a blonde, which isn't inherently weird, but paired with everything else, I guess it is. When I wasn't wearing any makeup, he would say something like, you seem out of sorts recently. I started wearing makeup again recently, and he's commented saying he likes that I'm back to my old self. I've noticed weird flirty remarks with him, but I always brush it off, because customers are always kind of weird, and I deal with that often anyway. He'll lean over the register counter to talk to me closer, just his body language in general. He does a double take when he leaves too, keeping his eyes on me. I think it's possible he knows what car I drive. He was at my work this morning, even though I always do closes. I've asked my boyfriend, who works with me, if it's true that he never shows up when I'm off. He said yes, it's true. I don't think he knows my schedule, but he might know my car and see it in the parking lot. He always parks out of the store outdoor camera view, so I still don't know what car he drives. The general manager was made aware by the manager, but the creep didn't interact with me much today because I was never alone at the register or on the floor. I was training a new cashier today. He was there a lot longer than usual, I'm assuming because he was waiting for a time when I was alone and there were no customers. I think he gave up when he realized I would be training for the majority of my shift and seeing how busy it was. Since I worked opening yesterday, he came in before my shift at work, probably assuming I would be opening again. I'm working closing tonight. Apparently, he came in earlier and saw the new cashier, so we actually ended up asking one of them. New cashier? Who quit? Probably thinking I quit. It's only 4.33. He usually comes in around 6 if I'm closing. I'm just waiting to see if he shows up for the second time today. I doubt he will since he might think I don't work today. My manager and I are going to keep a log of what time he comes in and leaves. I'm going to keep his phone number saved in my notes so I can look him up and hopefully find his name and other information. I will possibly keep my phone on the counter to voice record what he says. I wish I could record him in person, but it would be too obvious. If I get shown more security footage, I will video that instead. Last night, my boyfriend and I got in bed. Lights off, TV on, in bed naked as usual. A couple of minutes go by of us talking, and our cat jumps on the nightstand and is staring outside. He does this all the time so I assume it's a stray cat out there. He runs across the bed to my nightstand, so I peek outside. My cat's tail is all fluffy, so I think it's just the cat that he doesn't like. I look out the window and see a phone screen. I have no clue what was on it. I didn't think to actually look that hard. It was a red thing in the middle, but that's all I know. I look at my boyfriend, 
assuming I'm just seeing the reflection of his phone, when I see my boyfriend is not holding his phone. I back myself into the corner of the wall, so whatever's in the window can't see me. I just repeatedly say, there's someone outside, until my boyfriend finally gets up. I grab a sweater and pants from the floor, and we're just walking around the house as he calls 911. We come back to the room, and the guy is still out there, but my cat will not let me get near the window without growling, so I don't get to see his face. The cops get there a few minutes later and search the block. They come from the front yard in the backyard, climb some fences, and they don't find anyone. They just say they'll be on the lookout and to stay aware pretty much. My boyfriend and I are both reasonably shaken up. I point out the cat was acting similarly last night. Not exactly, but she was fluffed up and on edge. He pointed out that with how often I sleep naked or close to, it's possible the guy has done that multiple times to see. He also points out that with the lights on, you could definitely see into the bedroom from that window, so he would have been able to see us having sex if he caught us on the right night. There's no proof he's been there more than once, and with our neighborhood, he was probably just some guy on drugs wandering around. He left the gate open, stood there even though we clearly spotted him, and just didn't seem too smooth in his operation. I don't know. I just hope it was a one-time thing. I feel so helpless. I didn't go outside and do anything because I didn't know if he had a weapon, but I wish I could have. My boyfriend wants to buy a gun this weekend, and I hope that can at least give me some sense of security. Hello, I'm Evie. I wanted to tell my story because it was absolutely terrifying at the time. It all started the morning of February 14th, 2018. I was in middle school and the campus was buzzing with life. Guys were running around with gifts for their girlfriends. Girlfriends gave gifts to their boyfriends. Friends exchanged candies. All in all, everything seemed normal. I wasn't popular per se, but I knew everyone, and everyone knew me. But I preferred to hang around with a small group of close friends, because being around too many people made me anxious. During lunch, I was hanging around my usual group of friends, which consisted of two girls, Alex and Mia, and three guys, Nico, Adrian, and Elijah. Valentine's Day of all days made me even more anxious, because a lot of people would join our group because of my friend Adrian. He attracted a lot of girls, and my friend Mia was such a sweetheart, and a lot of guys wanted to date her. I began to feel overwhelmed, so I slipped out of my group and headed to a secret hiding place, which was just a bench that was way out in the field, sort of hidden by some trees. No one really went there, so it was a good place to catch my breath. As I was reading my book, I hear someone getting closer. I look up and see this guy, Emmanuel. When I saw Emmanuel, I instantly started to freak out because he always seemed to have this sort of infatuation with me. Every day, he would force himself on me, randomly hugging me, trying to kiss me, telling me he liked me. And believe it or not, I would often see him around my neighborhood. I decided to play it cool and continued reading when he suddenly just grabs my book out of my hands. Hey, what the hell, man? I yelled, and he simply responded with, Sorry, I just wanted your attention. I was still angry, but I tried to calm myself down. What do you want? I said. I really like you, and I want you to be my girlfriend. I swear, I'll treat you like a queen. After he said that, he handed me a box of chocolates and a cute stuffed bear. I thought it was a nice gesture, but I really felt uncomfortable whenever he was around. So I told him that even though it was sweet of him, I was already in a relationship, which obviously wasn't true. 
When the words left my mouth, he turned from being nice and calm to angry. He yelled at me, saying how dare I date someone that wasn't him. I tried to get up to leave, but he tightly grabbed my arm and forcefully kissed me. I tried pushing him off, but he was stronger than me, so I yelled for help at the top of my lungs and he quickly covered my mouth. So I bit his hand and kicked him in the balls. While he was shocked, I broke free and ran to my friend group. He yelled behind me, saying how he would assault me and then kill me. Obviously the duty guards heard this and immediately took action, but I just wanted to get to the safety of my group, so I kept running until I bumped into Adrian. I hugged him and cried my eyes out. He comforted me until I was ready to talk. I told him everything, and then I was suddenly called into the principal's office. They wanted to know everything that had happened, and the police were called. It was a long day, and I just wanted to go home. After I told them what happened, I was allowed to leave for home early. I later found out that in his house, there was a shrine built for me, with pictures of me doing various things, walking with my dog eating in my living room with my family, even of me changing. It was horrible and traumatizing. This story takes place last summer in August, when I went to visit my friend in another city. I'd been there for one day, and this night, we decided to go out for some drinks and then for dinner. While we were walking to the restaurant, dressed to the nines, a couple of men older than us stopped us and asked what we were doing that night. We chatted and then asked if we would be willing to come for a drink with them after. My friend and I, being young and liking the attention of course, said we would see how we feel, and they said that they would be staying at the restaurant that we saw them outside of, and that their usual table was right next to the patio entrance. We went for our dinner and as we were walking back, not thinking of these men that we'd previously encountered, we heard them calling over and they said, just join us for a drink. My friend and I kind of looked at each other and it was only about midnight, so we decided that we would go and join them for a drink. My friend is hilarious and we're both really assertive so she decided to ask for two triples and a shot of expensive tequila when they asked us what we wanted to drink. They laughed and said how they liked that she knew what she wanted. The drinks came out pretty quickly, but the shots were taking a while, and one of the gentlemen had gotten up and left the table. We assumed to take a call. After a few minutes, the gentleman came back to the table and sat down next to my friend and the shots came out not long after with the waitress. Not thinking anything of this, my friend and I took her shots, and almost five minutes later, my friend looked at me and said, Something's wrong. I don't feel right. My friend in general tends to overreact in some situations, so I brush it off and say, Don't worry. Everything's okay. The next part of the story is not coming from my own recollection, it's coming from my friend's recollection, because unfortunately, I don't remember anything from that night. My friend said that I began slurring my words and acting a lot more drunk than I should have been, given the amount that I had drank, and one of the gentlemen suggested that they give us a ride home, because I wasn't looking so well, and I'd probably drank too much. My friend asked if they'd had a car, because in this big city, it's not common to drive around, it's more common to taxi or Uber, and they'd pointed to a Rolls Royce that had illegally tinted windows and was running with a driver in the front about five feet away from the patio that we were sitting on, and it had been there for about 30 minutes. My friend immediately got a weird feeling, and though she was also feeling kind of loopy and dizzy, she got us both out of there. She said she provided no explanation, and she grabbed me by the arm and started dragging me down the street in a downtown, highly populated area while booking an Uber. According to my friend, the entirety of the Uber ride, I was sweating profusely, vomiting. I could barely walk. I couldn't speak. 
My eyes were rolled back, and I was completely incoherent. When asking my friend about how I got so sick, and how she didn't, she reminded me that she'd been drinking a lot the night before, and wasn't feeling that great, so she only took about a third of the shot because she wasn't able to finish the whole thing because she thought she was going to vomit. Me, on the other hand, of course. I took the entirety of the shot down and clearly got a higher dose of whatever was given. The next day, obviously, I felt like absolute garbage, but needless to say, I think my friend definitely saved us both that night, if not just me, from an unknown group of men who had unknown intentions with two young drunk girls and then drugged them in the heart of a big city. I moved into a large studio apartment complex a few months ago. I am a single female with a two-year-old daughter. My sister and a few of her friends came over about three weeks ago to hang out, have some beers, and play cards against humanity. My studio has an enclosed patio, save for a door-sized opening. Since my child was sleeping, I had everyone chill outside on the patio. We were having a great time, joking, talking, and listening to low-playing music when the security guard entered my patio. Hi there. Are we being too loud? Has someone placed a complaint? No, no, you guys are fine. I'm just doing my rounds. He lingered for a minute more and then strolled out into the night. We continued our activities and didn't really give him a second thought. He returned about 25 minutes later, right after most of the group had left. Only my sister, her friend Cody, and I remained. He was an overweight, late 40s, early 50s white male, and he wore glasses. He strolls into my patio once again and strikes up conversation. We learn he's a retired cop that had to quit the force after suffering a heart attack on duty. He states he had to undergo a quintuple bypass surgery, and after recovery, he started night security jobs. I felt sorry for him because of the medical history and sat and listened to him for quite a while. He must have stayed at least 30 minutes before my sister got uncomfortable and loudly announced that we were going to bed. He bid us a good night and left. Once inside, my sister said that she didn't like the way he was looking at me and she thought that he took a liking to me. I initially told her she was reading into it too much and that the guy was just lonely and had a long shift ahead. A week and a half later, my sister is visiting again and we're sitting inside my place, talking. My studio has a black screen door and a wooden door. I had the screen locked and the wood door wide open to let some air in. My sister's talking to me, and I have the sensation that someone is looking at me, so I glance up. The security guard is standing at the doorway of my patio, staring. I say hello, and he jerks forward, as if expecting an invitation in or something. But I turn my attention back to my sister, and when I glance back, he's gone. This week on Tuesday, I took a shower and threw on my red silk Japanese-style robe. I was washing dishes for about 25 minutes, and had poured a glass of wine, I turned from the kitchen to sit on my couch, and I strangled a scream. The security guard is almost pressed up against my screen door, staring at me through the foot-long crack of the wood door. I was so startled and shaken, but the first thing I did was to make sure my rope wasn't exposing me. I ran up to the screen. You scared me. With no emotion and no apology, he said. I was just doing my rounds. My scalp is crawling and I'm still shaky. I say, okay, well I'm going to bed now. He's still right up next to the screen door, all the way inside my patio. He turns and looks at my beach cruiser parked against the wall. Oh, you have a bike. You should put it inside because someone could take it. He said, yeah. I'll get to it, I respond. 
I pretty much slam the door and lock it. I sit down with the wine and calm my nerves. I was shaken up, but wasn't sure if he was really being a creeper or just a lonely individual that was looking for someone that had expressed interest. After a debate with my friends and sister, I contacted the property manager. I was actually surprised by how quickly it escalated. They took my verbal incident report over the phone and just informed me today that the guy has been fired. The property manager told me to call the police if I see him on premises again. When I was in high school, I worked part-time at a local coffee shop. One day, this kind of weird, overly friendly guy came in and started talking to me at the register. I wore a name tag with my nickname on it, and he asked if it was short for anything. I said yes and told him my full name. He asked what kind of name it is. My name originates from a Greek name, so I told him that because it's kind of interesting. He asked if I've ever been to the Greek festival in my city. I said no, and he replied with, Well, you belong there. Them Greek girls are hot. Mind you, at this point, I'm 16, and this was a grown man. After that is when things got weird. He would show up to the coffee shop every day and ask my co-workers when I would be coming in or if I was working that day. Eventually, he would start sitting at the seat right by the front door, waiting for me to come in. One day, he physically stood up and blocked my path and asked if he could buy me a coffee and then he grabbed my hand. When I declined and tried to walk past to go in the back, he tried to follow me behind the counter and into the back room. He would hang out there for hours just watching me and would try to constantly talk to me. My managers eventually had to tell me to work in the back until he left every day, and then he started sitting in the seat closest to the back room. After that, I had to start coming into work through the back door and staying there until he left. My co-workers had to tell him I quit, hoping he would stop. Then he became obsessed with one of the other girls, and the cycle started all over again. He truthfully didn't seem that harmful, except for the time he grabbed my hand. But it was creepy, and he was constantly there. The owner of the coffee shop had to file a restraining order in the end, because no matter what we did or told him, it didn't stop. And he was there, just watching and waiting. Nothing ever happened after the restraining order. He was allowed in the plaza the coffee shop was in still, just obviously not in the coffee shop, and not near the patio by the front door. And we usually saw him go to the grocery store until the restraining order. He just disappeared after that. It's very creepy and kind of scary as a 16-year-old. This happened back in the 80s, so very much the pre-cell phone era. I was in high school at the time. One night after dinner, my mom suggested we take a walk around the block to walk off dinner. My brother and dad were watching TV and opted to stay home, so it was just us, girls. We lived out in the fringes of the suburbs, in a subdivision that was semi-rural. By that, I mean there were houses, but no streetlights or sidewalks. Everyone had septic tanks, as there was no sewer service and that kind of thing. The houses were all well back from the road, and the lots were wooded. Anyway... We were walking around the block, which is about 1.5 miles in total, and we're almost back home. It's pitch black that night. There was no moon, and we had a flashlight to use as needed. Without it, you couldn't see much past a foot or two around you. We mainly used it as a signal if a car went by, but there wasn't really anyone around, so we had it switched off and were just walking and chatting. Just as we turned the corner onto our street, we suddenly heard footsteps behind us. 
This was a bit weird as we just come from that way and hadn't seen or heard anyone walking on that street or coming down the driveways we passed. But we just figured it was some neighbor also out for a walk and we hadn't noticed them in the dark. So I turned around to look and switched the flashlight on to see who it was. They immediately switched a flashlight on too, so I could only see their light and not them. They said nothing. We kept walking, but the footsteps behind us sped up now. They sounded heavy, so we thought it was a man. We sped up. He sped up. I turned the flashlight back on, and he turned his on again in silence. We were too scared to call out, and now we were approaching our driveway. As we got there, I pushed my mom in front and told her to get up the driveway, which was steep and long. Once she had a start, I sprinted up after her. As I did, the footsteps veered away to the other side of the road and kept going. Nothing was ever said by this person, and normally people here wave and spoke when out walking or even driving by. When we got up to the house, my dad said it was probably just a neighbor. So, my brother and I got into my car and drove down the road to see who it was. No one was there. We went all around the roads and no one was walking on them. There wasn't time for him to leave the area. Either it was a nasty neighbor getting off on scaring us and then ducking into a house, or whatever it was came out of the woods behind us and then disappeared back into them. About four years ago, I worked as a laundress. I worked 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. and would often work alone. We usually have a security guard posted near the parking lot, and later in the day, they patrol the building. They carry a radio and pepper spray. Anyway, a new guy started, and I never saw him watching over the parking lot when I came in each morning. Throughout my shift, he would come into my laundry room. He was talkative, but I noticed he would look at my body a lot when he thought I wouldn't notice. One day I came into work and started putting my stuff away and getting ready to begin. I hadn't turned on all the lights yet so there were parts of the room I couldn't see. Suddenly I hear radio static in the corner of the room, and I see a red radio light. I turn on the lights, and the new guy is in the corner of the room, hiding and watching me. When I asked what he was doing there, he said he was just hanging out and started laughing. It was obvious he was waiting for me. He ended up doing this so often that I got used to it. I came in early one day and was working in one of our smaller areas. He came into the small room to talk to me. He's a big guy, so I couldn't get around him. He was just talking to me, but I couldn't move or leave the room because he blocked the door. He asked me why I came in early that day, and I told him it was because I had to leave early later. He told me that I was required to tell him all my hours so he could always know where I am. He was leaning over me and felt like he was trying to upset me. I had this horrible feeling in my stomach that he was about to try something, so I pushed past him and called my supervisor, who said he would keep an eye on him. I told him that I had a bad gut feeling about this guy and that I needed to leave for the day. The next day, he was fired. Apparently, he wasn't in the guard tower at the start of the ship because he would spend most mornings in the woods near the parking area, recording girls walking in for their shifts each morning. They also found a huge collection of pop and soda cans and coffee cups in his locker that he admitted that he dug out of the various trash cans around where I and the other girls worked. His wife shortly left him and took full custody of their newborn baby. So this is an ongoing situation, but it went from annoying to seriously creepy. 
There's a maintenance guy at the office building I work at. He's hired through the landlord of the building, not our company. His name is Bob. Bob is an older guy, maybe late fifties, and a former heroin addict. I say that, but we're all pretty sure Bob still occasionally indulges in the habit. He's very socially awkward, and his mannerisms and way of speaking are strange. He talks really slow and pauses in places where pauses don't make sense, or trails off mid-sentence. He also gets really close when he talks to you and makes intense eye contact, or stares at me through our huge front window that happens to be in front of my desk. So, overall, a mildly creepy guy. He's done some weird things in the past, like give me his personal number, bought a co-worker a $200 wedding gift, and had it delivered to her. The staring at people through the window, and he gave me a toy riding horse thing for my son, the kind that's on springs and rocks back and forth, and he asks me personal questions about my marriage and tried to ask me to go on a date with him. I also found my car door open and a bunch of my stuff, like paperwork, and some perfume and makeup I keep in my center console, moved around once when he was here. Today, he comes in the front office and just kind of stands there after saying hi. I ask my co-worker if I can go out and have a smoke, and she says yes. I go get in my car and keep the door cracked so I could smoke. I was parked under a covered carport thing outside the back door, across from the utility and supply room. All of a sudden, Bob is standing there, and kind of grabs the door and opens it a bit. I don't know where he came from, but I was listening to music, so I wasn't really paying attention. I took my earbuds out and looked at him like, what? He doesn't answer right away. He then asks me if I can take him to the store. A. He has a big white truck that he knows I know he has. B. He knows damn well I can't just up and leave while I'm working. I tell him that and he says, no, no, it's okay. I already asked another co-worker and she said okay. I ask him why he can't just drive himself and he stands there for a second, looking at me. And then he asks me to help him with something in the utility room. I say no and I need to get back in before I get yelled at. He stared for a minute, and then smiles the creepiest fucking smile, and says, No, you won't. They think you took me to the store. We have plenty of time. I don't know if I'm accurately conveying the creepy, scary vibe he was putting off, but I was scared at this point. I didn't know what he wanted or what he was trying to accomplish but it wasn't anything good. And on top of that, he wasn't moving out of my way and he was six inches away from me. I tell him to move and he stands there for a few seconds, but then finally moves. I dialed 911 on my cell phone and jumped out of the car and ran inside. I seriously thought he was going to grab me and push me into the utility room or something. I'm still shaken up about it. Oh, and he didn't ask a co-worker anything about the store. He made that up. He left right after the whole thing, and I really don't know what to do about the whole thing. When I was in my late sophomore through my junior year of high school, I was diagnosed with insomnia. I would sleep maybe an hour or two every 24 hour period, with sporadic binge sleeping rather randomly. Anyway, being awake at all time essentially made me alone a lot. So, one summer, I decided to walk to a gas station near my house to get a Gatorade or some shit. It's about 2am, no one is awake in my house, so I just walk out. I'm arriving at the gas station after a pretty uneventful walk and I'm approaching that glow from the overhead lights, so things on the far edges are visible, but illuminated very poorly. The gas station has a really steep drive to enter from the main road, and the other end has a small pothole-filled parking lot with a narrow little alley that leads to an avenue. 
As a relative side note, I grew up in a very average middle-class neighborhood, not a suburb, not inner city, and really close to a country town neighborhood than anything else, I guess. Anyway, I start heading towards the front door, and in my peripheral vision, something moves in the darkness. So, not being very suspicious, I lazily turn to look. I can make out the shape of a person, and they're very rapidly materializing from out of the dark. It's a kid, probably a little older than me, and he's on a pretty fast clip jog. He jogs right up to me, and stops about half an arm's length away. We just stare at each other. The weird thing, though, is that his upper lip is essentially shredded. It was like he fell off a motorcycle or something, and he was bleeding. He was also bleeding out of his nose, and his lower left eyelid was drooping down and full of blood. He had a bunch of blood splattered on his white t-shirt too, as if he'd sneezed or something. I began to say something, but before I could utter one syllable, he just moved to my left and kept running. Without saying a word, I went in, got my drink and walked home. I was waiting to hear about it in the news the next day. I didn't. So, while hanging out with a close friend, I mentioned what had happened. We mulled it over for a bit, and then, he suggested something. He knew it was a wild shot in the dark, but he suggested that the kid didn't exist, and that I just really needed sleep. I hadn't even thought of that, and to this day, I don't know. So I was walking through the town center with my husband. We were just talking about what bills needed paying and that kind of thing. I looked straight in front of me, and there was a man. This was no ordinary man. This was a man whose face is etched in my brain, in my memory, a memory I locked away many years ago. When I was around eight, my aunt, who had a few learning disabilities, lived on her own. She was not very clean lived in a one-bedroom flat with around five cats. It stunk. It was dirty. But I used to go help her tidy up and look after the cats. There was a man who lived in the upstairs flat. His name was Chris. Chris also had cats, and his cats had kittens. Chris had befriended my aunt and used to come talk to her. They seemed like good friends, but I didn't like him much. One day while I was there, Chris turned up and he'd been feeding kittens for most of the night as the mom cat was rejecting them. He said he was tired, and if he fell asleep to wake him in two hours to feed the kittens. Two hours went by, and my aunt said we need to wake Chris so we could feed the kittens. My aunt tried to wake him, shaking him. All he did was grumble and say, Fuck off, get away from me. I'm sleeping. My aunt started to laugh, thinking he was joking and started pulling at his foot. She hit down on his foot and shouted, Chris, you need to get up and go feed your kittens. All of a sudden he jumps up, no emotion in his face, looks straight towards me, and started to march my way across the room. I tried to run for the door, but he managed to catch me around my neck with his hands, and they got tighter and tighter. I wanted to scream. I wanted to cry. I wanted my mom. I thought I was going to die as he raised me off the floor with his hand still around my neck, slowly creeping up the wall. I was eight, around 56 pounds, so I wasn't very big at all. I was quite petite. I could feel the life being drained from me. All of a sudden, I felt my body sliding quickly down the wall. I felt a very sharp pain at the top of my leg where it meets your backside and realized he'd slammed me down on a radiator that was on the wall. With that, he let go, straightened himself out, and said, I'm gonna feed the kittens. And he left. I was crying so hard, I just wanted my mom. My aunt just stood there, mouth open. She didn't try to help. She just stood there, screaming while he did it. Funny thing is, I know she was screaming. But in the few minutes that it took to happen, it was like silence for me. Pure silence. All I could remember is just looking in Chris's eyes, 
thinking I'm never going to see my mom or brothers or sisters again. My aunt rang my mom. She caught a taxi straight to her house. My stepdad came and went to find Chris. He disappeared. No one knew where he was. For two weeks, my stepdad waited outside the flats, but Chris never came back. Some cat protective people came and got the cats and kittens and took them away. The police showed up as my mom was ringing them, as a neighbor had heard the commotion and rang them. They took our statements and took us home. I had photos taken of my injuries around my neck and just under my backside. I had a big gash from the side of the radiator. I had to have it dressed by a nurse for a while. It turned out okay but left a scar. Chris went to court and luckily I didn't have to attend because of my age. All he got was one year conditional discharge. That was not justice. It was a joke. I was scared to leave my home. I didn't want to play outside with my friends. My aunt went on to not talk to the family and marry that man. I wanted so much to wreck the wedding I hated him, her, them. I hated them to the point I cried. Why should they be happy when they stole my light? My light was now dark. It divided a lot of the family. It took a long time for nightmares to stop and the anxiety he was going to come finish what he started. I put it away in a box, never wanting to open it again. And there he was, stood right in front of me, right there. I wanted to go slap him, beat him up, but I also wanted my husband to just hold me tight and tell me I was okay. As I looked back, he looked at me, but I don't even think he knew who I was but I certainly knew who he was. As quick as I saw him, he was gone. I stood on my feelings for a few days, but I think it's time to put them back in the box where they belong. I matched with Priya on Bumble some months ago. We got along very well, went on drives. Boutique coffee outlets like Third Wave got a lot of patronage from us as well. Usual late thirties couple, no kids, and significant disposable income, thanks to tech jobs in Bengaluru. We both lived relatively far away from each other. We'd stay at each other's place whenever we could. I was married before and I'm a cat parent. This stray adopted me and my ex-wife some years ago. And since my ex moved to Europe after the divorce, I was left to take care of it for about two years. Apu, the cat, is a sweet, cuddly brown bundle. In 2019, just before the pandemic, my ex and I had been to the US to visit her younger sister. A seller on Etsy had listed cat collars for sale, which came with a bell. We'd brought a dozen or so of those collars and brought them back with us. The cat collar with a jingling bell on a poo was hilarious. He hated it for a bit, but then he got used to it. Over the past two months, the bell on that cat collar started disappearing. I didn't think much of it. Those collars were bought in 2019. I thought they were going to wear off sooner or later. And since I had about a dozen of them, I would always change the collar on a poo. But shortly after that, the bell would go missing. Last month, I decided to stay over at Priya's place in Whitfield. She lives by herself in one of those gated villas. I don't worry much for a poo. He does his business in the litter box and knows how to work the cat food dispenser. One thing about Priya, she cannot stand smoking. And I had, for reasons of my own, hadn't disclosed that I do smoke sometimes. So yeah, I was staying at her villa and it starts raining heavily every day. We don't have much to do. Stuck indoors, we finish a bottle of Amrut single malt whiskey. The neighboring villas are all flooded, they're pumping water out, and we realize it's only a matter of time before Priya's village will be flooded too. We want to secure the doors as much as we can to stop the water from entering. I ask Priya if she has any old clothes or blankets that we can use so we could create a barricade. A futile attempt, but we were drunk 
and we wanted to do something. She hands me an old, hideous green blanket, along with some old beige curtains and t-shirts. We plug the doors as best we can. We're tipsy and tired. We collapse on the couch. I vaguely remember saying something half funny about the hideous green blanket. That was my mother's favorite blanket. After she passed, I would always have it with me whenever I'd have to sleep. But then I remember having it on me. When I had a miscarriage, I felt my mother's presence, she said. And you know what? She hated cats, she continued. So, my day doesn't have her mother, who hated cats when alive. She believes in the afterlife, and she's had a miscarriage. Yet, she's held onto that hideous green blanket for God knows how long. The things I realize one rainy, drunken night that I'd never known for months. The perils of modern day dating. I get this sudden urge to smoke. I excuse myself, lock myself in the bathroom and open the windows. Once I finished, I threw the cigarette butts into the toilet and flushed. That's when I hear an oddly familiar sound. I lift the lid off of the toilet tank. I see four of Apu's cat collar trinkets. I quietly walk out the back door. The streets are flooded. There are no cabs. I book a hotel room on a Goda app to stay for the night. I've blocked Priya's numbers. I've deleted Bumble. Apu's cozied up next to me, purring away with no care in this world as I type. It's raining again. It was June 20th, 2011. I was on duty working a detail on my day off. I had a little over two years in the job and was always eager to jump in to help other guys. I saw a call come out where a guy pointed a gun at his wife, loaded his car full of guns and ammo, and told her he was going to kill his adult kids who live about an hour away. She calls 911. He's gone by the time units arrive. No history of mental illness, not drunk. This came out of nowhere for him, according to his wife. I see the heavy units bolowing for him, so I get permission to leave my boring detail and help look. I get a weird feeling and text my dad that I'm looking for this nut and have a bad feeling that I'm going to find him. I just found out I was about to be a father, and I texted my wife at the time and told her I loved her and that I had a bad feeling. I was sitting in the dead center of the county border between east and west, on the very south county line, in an area I always called No Man's Land, because backup was usually the farthest there, six to eight minutes away on average. I had another guy there with me for a bit, and he saw me take my patrol rifle out of the roof rack and chamber around. He laughed at me and said, totally unnecessary, and eventually left for a different call. Now I'm sitting at the county line alone, and we get an update that the bordering county was in pursuit with him. He jumped out with a rifle and pointed it at the deputies. They back off to not get shot, and when they try to engage him, he disappeared in his car. Okay, so the guy is obviously now pretty damn committed to whatever his mission was. The description was a gray Toyota with an army bumper sticker and a navy bumper sticker. I see a gray Toyota go by me toward the next county, so I pull out to check the tag, and I see two bright pink stickers on the window. I think to myself, the stickers are pink, not military, while I try to catch up. As I get close, I see one says army and one says navy. I grab the radio and call out. I'm behind the suspect, headed south into an adjoining county. That's all I get before he slams on the brakes. I don't try to light him up or anything. He stops in the middle of the road. I do the same. He's able to get out first because action is faster than reaction. As he gets out, I see a chrome 357 with a 6-inch barrel in his right hand. Fuck. 
He's facing away from me, which seemed odd. I jump out with my patrol rifle and retreat to my trunk for cover, since a Crown Vic door won't do shit to help me with those rounds. He turns towards me, gun still in hand. He's by his car, probably 20 feet from me. We make eye contact as I raise my rifle, flicking the safety off. As I'm starting to squeeze the trigger, he raises the gun to his temple, and his gun goes bang before I'm able to take a shot. He drops immediately. I get on the radio and announce shots fired. Pretty soon, backup arrives. A witness calls 911 and says, I witnessed the deputy shoot the man down. Now it's an OIS investigation until the autopsy the next day when they can prove it's a big hole in his head and not a 556 size hole. There was no dash cam because it was an old car they were getting ready to auction off. It was pretty awesome to see my body go into action and perform as I trained without having conscious thought about it. It happened so fast. Less than a minute passed from when I called out that I was behind him to when I called shots fired. I didn't get shit for it. No commendation. No award for my file. Nothing besides some PTSD as a prize. I didn't sleep good for six months because when I closed my eyes, I ran through scenarios of what would have happened if things were different. I played it out every single way, from he ran into the woods, to we exchange rounds, to he kills me. I did some emotional drinking, which didn't help me either. Everyone thought the traumatic part for me was watching him die, but nobody really could understand that was it. The haunting part was the sinking feeling as I threw my radio down, and for the first time in my life, I said, oh fuck. I'm gonna die. I never saw a shrink for it because I didn't want to look like a coward. I should have, and highly recommend it. It worked itself out for me. Not sure how, but I have no issues from it. Now it's just this wild ass story I get to tell. I don't know what time my kids were born, but I'll never forget where I was on June 20th, 2011, at 10.51. And when I get those weird feelings now at work, you bet your ass I follow them. When people find out I used to work in law enforcement, usually the first question I get asked is, what's the craziest thing you did or saw? It's hard to pick one. And after stumbling across a subreddit, I thought I'd share some. I worked for a small to mid-sized agency for six years as a patrolman, detective, and police sergeant. I also think people want to hear cool stories, but I usually trail off into something depressing. I haven't really told my wife most of these things, just buried stuff deep I guess. Summer 2014, officer involved shooting. I was working the night shift, and about two hours into my shift, my neighboring district officer asked if I wanted to go grab dinner with him. abso freaking lootly Mexican food during a slow weekday is always a good call. 229 Center, show me in 226 Code 7. Officer K and I placed our orders and are drinking sweet tea, eating chips and salsa, and are just waiting on our food to arrive. Officer K is really deep into telling me some funny old war stories from his previous time in the military. He doesn't hear the tones come over our earpieces and continues to tell his story in hilarious detail. I had already stopped listening and began to listen to the radio call come in. Shooting just occurred at 1254 Belmont Street. Suspect shot the brother-in-law in the forehead with a pistol. The suspect is still on scene. White male late 50s, wearing a white shirt, blue jean shorts. The suspect is still on the property. I'm familiar with the area and know that it's on the very edge of our city limits and is possibly a county call and not a city call. 
I hear my shift sergeant and patrol lieutenant get dispatched and are en route. Officer K and I are about a six minute drive from that location, maybe three to four minutes running code. I get up and tell the waitress to cancel my order and start running out the door. Officer K is still clueless because he didn't hear what was going on. He realizes what is going on when I'm running out the door. I didn't even think of telling him for whatever reason. I just tunnel visioned all the information dispatch was putting out and mentally making a map on the fastest way there along with the mental map of the area and where the house could be. I run to my Tahoe, start it up, and start hauling ass with lights and sirens. I see two of our patrol vehicles heading south on the highway already as I'm on the service road. It was the sergeant and lieutenant. I ended up about a minute behind them as we were all collectively driving toward the call, running code. Dispatch updates that the suspect is still on scene and is still armed and smoking under a carport. I catch up to them as soon as they hit the exit ramp for the main road towards the call. We all enter the area at the same time and drive towards the scene. The house ends up being on the corner. It was dark and it was hard seeing the house numbers to see where it was. The first two units in front of me start to make a U-turn to come back toward me while they are still looking for the house. I saw a white male smoking a cigarette under a lighted carport, matching the description. He was smoking a cigarette with his left hand, and his right hand was behind his back. I announce it over the radio while I step out of my vehicle, and the sergeant and lieutenant maneuver their vehicles and get out. The sergeant and I end up walking in a V towards the suspect, and the lieutenant walks far left to try to negotiate with him or something. We started about 50 yards away and continue walking closer to him. Both of us had our weapons drawn. I was telling the suspect to show me both of his hands. My voice was getting louder and louder, and both the sergeant and I were giving him explicit commands. The suspect kept saying things like, Why are you here? Or, My sister is over there. This is her house. The sergeant and I were about 18 yards away, when he moved the right hand away from his back. I immediately saw a pistol in his hand as it was coming up and being drawn towards us. I fired one shot that struck him in the left arm and entered his chest, stopping in his spine. The second shot I fired was a glancing round to the top left of his head that didn't penetrate. He was falling as I was firing. I don't remember aiming at all to this day, I just remember being focused on his hands and watching every movement he made. I believe that the firearms training I had and shoot-don't-shoot shoot drills we practiced during in-service training helped me. The sergeant and I walked towards the suspect and handcuffed him and called for two ambulances. The lieutenant went to check with the family members and the initial victim. The victim was in the last stages of dying. He was shot by the suspect's 25 caliber pistol in the middle of the forehead. From what I gathered, the family had a get-together and had been drinking all day. The suspect was planning on leaving to get more beer, and the victim was trying to stop him. The suspect had a felony warrant for DWI, and the victim was trying to help him. The suspect did not want the help, and after an argument, shot him. The ambulance came and regretfully picked up the suspect first. I don't think much could be done for the victim at that point, but I think he should have been a priority. The suspect was transported to the ER, and Officer K ended up staying with him until CID could make it for a statement. Since my patrol lieutenant was there, he began making all the admin phone calls to get CID over. I started setting out cones, marked the scene, and took some preliminary pictures. I called my wife to tell her I was okay if anything made it to the news in the next hour or so. The next call I made was to my police association to talk with the on-call lawyer. I had a call from the PA's president and vice president within 20 minutes to see if they could do anything for me or my family. I was impressed with their support and concern 
and later saw the benefits they would host to help out other PA members. CID arrived and inventoried my pistol. They collected it and gave me another one to take home with me. I didn't feel any grief or regret about what I did at the time. I still don't after knowing all the facts after the investigation was over. The suspect, now a convict, is still alive as far as I know. I went to his sentencing hearing. I was given about two weeks of admin time off and spoke with a counselor to make sure I was okay to come back to work. Stay safe. Please stress to young officers, learn the geography, and don't rely on electronic aids. I was able to picture the block the house was on just by knowing the street numbers. The house where the shooting occurred was a few houses from where our jurisdiction ended. It ended up being a county call after all. For context, I'm 6 foot 2, and at the time I was like 18 stone, or 115 kilograms, so a big unit. In a past life, I worked as an officer in a tourist town in the UK, walking the streets, interacting with locals and visitors, the usual community engagement type stuff. On a hot day in the height of summer, I stopped off to get a bottle of water. I was stood in line with my helmet off enjoying the feel of the AC hitting the back of my head and going down my neck and back, trying to cool the space between me and my body armor. Crack. Something hit me across the back of my head. Turning slowly, my hand dropping to my CS spray, I looked to see who had just assaulted me. I was met with an old lady with a walking frame and walking stick. She proceeds to have a go at me, you should be out there catching criminals, not in here stuffing your face, she said. I'm just getting a bottle of water and did you hit me? I asked. Yes, because you were ignoring me, she replied. Right. I turn away from her as there's now a till free and purchased my water and left. About 30 minutes later, the inspector gets a hold of me on the radio asking to meet with me to discuss a complaint. So, he comes out to where I am and gives me the details. A member of the public had complained that I was being rude and belligerent to them and ignored them when they were talking to me. I asked when this happened, and he told me today within the past hour. I then give him my side of the details, and when I mention the hit to the head, he immediately wants to go to the shop. So... We go off in his car back to the shop where I got my water from. Once there, he goes straight to the till area and is excitedly asking me, Where were you standing exactly? I showed him, and he smiled from ear to ear and just pointed. There was a CCTV camera pointed right at where I'd been standing. We went and reviewed the CCTV, and sure enough, there I was, stood there, helmet in hand enjoying the AC on my head and the OAP behind me. You can see on the CCTV she's trying to talk to me, but I have an earpiece in and can't hear properly, so I genuinely missed that she was talking to me. Then it happened. She took hold of her walking stick and proceeded to tap me on the back, on my body armor. She did this four or five times maybe before she just cracks me on the back of my head. I turned in such a way my face could be seen on the camera, and you could clearly read my lips for the short conversation we had. With that, the inspector turns to the staff. I would like a copy of that burning off, and he just left, got back into his car and drove off, leaving me and the staff member there like, okay. At the end of my shift, I went to his office with a CCTV, and he filled me in. This lady had been a serial complainer against police for anything and everything. Patrol cars parked in the wrong place. This officer looked at me funny. Officer was seen doing things they shouldn't. But this time, he had a counter-argument. When he called her back to advise that he'd spoken to me, he opened with, 
What did you do to get the officer's attention? I tapped him on his arm, she replied. Really? Yes, she said. You know there's CCTV in the shop, especially around the till area, he told her. So, she said. So, I have CCTV of you assaulting my officer. You struck him across the back of his head with your walking stick. Apparently after this revelation, she was very shouty and incoherent before calming down and being delivered the parting shot by the inspector. We will ignore the fact you assaulted an officer while on duty as long as you stop making unfounded complaints against my staff. We are entitled to a break to get food and drink. We can park our cars in the visitor's car park of your complex when dealing with incidents. We are human and should be allowed to work unimpeded. As far as I know, she never did make a complaint against an officer again. We did attend antisocial behavior in the area of her complex, which we were sure would create a complaint of why we were not doing something about it. But no, we didn't hear a peep. So we get a call from an assault in progress at the truck stop. Apparently a Greyhound bus had a bunch of people fighting, so the bus stopped at the truck stop and someone called the police. The security guard at the truck stop ends up fighting some guy and needs help, so the dispatchers have us run code 3. I'm first on scene and I see maybe 30 people standing around and the security guard on top of a guy yelling at him to put your hands behind your back. A couple of guys are yelling at the guy fighting with the security guard. Just do what he says, man. But the guy is really drunk and being really combative. I run over, grab the guy and he's in cuffs pretty quickly. Other officers arrive and began defusing the situation. So once the guy catches his breath, I ask what the hell was going on. He tells me, Sir, I just got out of prison. I was locked down for the last four years. When the bus stopped, I grabbed a couple of four locos and drank them on the bus. This guy looked like your stereotypical gang member and ex-convict. Tattoos on his head, pressed t-shirt, black sweatshorts, and that kind of stuff. His friend walks up to me and tells me how they both just got released. And when this guy started drinking on the bus, he started a fight with the black guys on the bus because the black guy looked at him funny. The guy ended up TKOing our friend in handcuffs, so the bus driver pulled over and this guy started fighting with everyone. That's when security got involved. Well, I'm quickly figuring out that this guy is just a shitty drunk and he's going right back to jail after only being free for five to six hours. Some old white guy who was on the bus also walks up to me and calmly asked, Hey sir, what's this guy's deal? He's been starting shit with people the whole ride. I tell the old man, eh, He just got out of prison after four years and had too much to drink. The old man says, That's no excuse for his bullshit. I just got out too. I was locked up for 36 years. You don't see me acting like a fucking moron. What's this guy's problem? I say, wait, you just got out today, 36 years and today is your first day out. He says, yeah, we all just got out today. The bus is dropping us all off in whatever city we're from, just left of Houston on the way to San Antonio, then Dallas. Curious, I asked him, what did you do? Murder someone back in the 80s? Unfortunately, yes. Got no family anymore. I'm on the way to a halfway house and I gotta deal with knuckleheads like this. I decided not to dig any deeper into this old man's life, but the thought of serving 36 years in prison is nuts. Imagine all the change that's happened since the 80s. It probably feels like a time machine to this guy. Well, there's no point to this story other than some drunk ass managed to make it a few hours before going back to jail, while another guy spent a lifetime in prison.
Have a good day, folks. The tyranny of feeling. That's the problem with police. You don't show enough feeling, she said. You don't feel enough. She's right, of course. A drowning in a desert town with no lakes. My partner jumped into the canal and pushed a huge man to the bank. I struggled and pulled. He pushed and slipped. Both of us wet and covered with mud. Neither of us feeling the cold water. Our new officer arrived and I jumped into the scene, pushing on a man's chest while I hovered over his face, trying to see inside his mouth. His wife, hands on my shoulders, screaming in my ear, screaming no. I couldn't feel her breath on my neck, her tears on my head. Finally, my partner says stop, just stop. I looked down and saw my pants were covered in the man's blood which had poured from the bullet hole in his temple. I couldn't feel the wet blood soaking through my pants. She's right, of course. I couldn't feel enough. A gunshot in the basement of a home. As I made my way down the stairs, the air was filled with a haze. A man missing his face, and a rifle sitting in a lake of blood on the bed. Three walls covered with meat. The mewling, writhing figure, unable to speak, but clearly letting me know the horror, the pain he was feeling. A few inches of jaw glued to the carpet, the stubble of beard visible from inside. The home now filled with explosive gas, a mother unaware, a mother begging us to let her son die. As I grabbed the woman by the arm, I couldn't feel her brittle, old bones under my grip. I couldn't smell the gas, couldn't gag as I pulled the jaw from the carpet. I couldn't find it inside me to feel the horror. She's right, of course. I couldn't feel enough. A mother, worn by the chemotherapy, held hostage. A son, a mind broken by drugs and now holding mom hostage until a girlfriend returns. I can't feel the gun in my hands. A pain develops. A promise of a drink for a thirsty mother, worn by the long negotiation. A foot through the door. A son brings the knife towards my partner. I can't feel my friend get cut. I can't feel my gun, screwed into the temple of a man who's so close to having a mind broken by a bullet. I've got the knife. The officer behind me yells. I can't feel the relief. She's right, of course. I couldn't feel enough. A breathing problem. A medical call. Leave it for the medics. But I'm here, and this lady isn't breathing. Won't breathe again. I can't feel her granddaughter behind me, watching me place the shock pads on grandma's chest watching me push helplessly on grandma as the machine tells me to push harder. Later now, the medic's gone. As her husband pulls me into a hug, I can't feel his heart breaking inside. Her husband has to say goodbye, and I go to her first. I never knew her, but she wouldn't want to be seen like this, not for a goodbye. I pull a breathing tube from her throat, I can feel the bulb catch on her teeth, her stiffening jaw fighting this release. I pull on the bone needles screwed into her shins. I can't feel how the diabetes has scarred her lower legs. I wipe the blood from her nose and mouth. I can't feel how cold the blood already is. She's right, of course. I couldn't feel enough. A naked monster celebrating his first day outside of prison with a cocktail of street drugs and liquor, kicking in the door. A boy, just eight, standing behind the door, holding a bat to protect his four-year-old sister from the monster outside. I can't feel their panic. I don't know they stand just feet from where the monster and I fight. 
I can't feel his fingernails carving deep and bloody into my arm. I can't feel the burning sweat, blood, and mace spray into the bloody cuts. He can't feel the pain. He's well beyond feeling. As he breaks the porch, breaks the door, breaks my skin, breaks the quiet peace of the neighborhood, I can't feel his hair in both my hands, pulling him back from the sidewalk where he slams his head. Even today, I can't feel those five long scars on my arm. She's right, of course. I couldn't feel enough. A stolen car, a property crime, a man, too much time inside bars, reaching for the gun wrapped in a white t-shirt, cleaner than any of his other clothing. I can't feel his hands around my waist as we fight, as we drag him from the car. I can't feel the cars driving by us as I punch. His girlfriend screams, but I can't feel her fear. As I continue to punch five, six, seven hits, why won't he stop? My wrist breaks, but I can't feel that right now. I'll give you this, he says later as we laugh together. You boys know how to get down. I ain't never been punched like that. I can't feel the admiration, can't feel how sometimes the only one who understands is the guy you have to fight on the other side of the game. Months later, putting together another Lego set for my son, he can't feel the bone inside my wrist give too much, the sharp pain that makes me gasp. I can't feel the wrist, the back, the shoulder that is given too much. She's right, of course. I couldn't feel enough. Another friend, another loss. Years ago now, he pulled that girl out of the cold creek. Did he feel how the six-year-old body was too heavy, too water-soaked? She was the same age as his daughter. His daughter the same age as mine. His daughter's handmade cards along my daughter's on the fridge. He'd felt enough. He must have had enough. This happened about seven years ago, but it's a story I try to tell every officer that I train. It was summertime, and just one of those hot, nasty, sticky nights. But thankfully, we were not really dealing with any of the unrest that had been rolling through the country for the past two years. However, because of the aforementioned unrest, attitudes towards police were at an all-time low. We had, what felt like, very few on our side, and I'm not even going to get into the politics of the region. Anyways, I'm riding with a senior officer, and the man that would later convince me to become a training officer. And we get dispatched to a noise complaint. Apparently, a bunch of teenagers are having a party, and the mixture of music and fireworks is upsetting the neighbors. We arrive on scene, and it is exactly what has been reported. Loud EDM music, fireworks being fired from the backyard, and even at the front door. You can smell alcohol and weed smoke, Pretty standard start. Knock. Knock louder. Try the doorbell. Knock again. It takes a minute or two before someone answers. Now, the kids in the town are smart, and their parents normally have enough money to have a big enough house that we cannot see anything from the doorway. We tell the young man that opened the door to turn off the outdoor music as it's past the city's quiet hours. We also remind him that fireworks are illegal in the county. He assures us that he's going to turn the music off directly and that the fireworks aren't coming from their property, but from the field behind them. But we didn't actually see any fireworks after we pulled up to the house, so we can't confirm. So far, pretty routine, nothing of note. Until a teenage girl comes wandering into the foyer while taking a big drink of her twisted iced tea. Before I even get a word out, my partner, 
calls her out by name. She's apparently on the cheer team with my partner's daughter. So, we detain her, and since we're all young and stupid once, my partner's trying to get a hold of her parents, but reminds me that since we're detaining her, we have to run her. And while she isn't exactly taking us seriously, she's calling us pigs and other horrible stuff. Anyways, my partner and I don't expect to have anything flag when we run her, but we are wrong. Bench warrant for FTA on a pending charge of disturbing the peace and resisting arrest. I call my partner over and ask if he wants to break the news or if I should. Well, the way we normally work arrests, assuming they are not resisting, is we will have one of the officers first inform of the arrest and reason. Then they will read our department's Miranda card. During that time, the second officer will cuff and do a pat-down. Yay, I get to be the unlucky officer that has to frisk a teenage cheerleader in front of her friends. I do an extremely cursory pat-down, trying to avoid any appearance of misconduct. I do not care that I have a body-worn camera. I just don't want to deal with the blowback and reputation of liking to touch little girls. I, of course, do not find anything. And since she's been so cooperative, we cuffed her hands in front of her to give her a little better comfort. In the meantime, while we have drawn a crowd, the music has been turned off. No fireworks and no other obvious underage drinking. We radio in that we're coming back to the station with one juvie in talks with a bench. Did I mention that my partner was also the department's senior club patroller? Yeah, he would often make sure all the curbs were exactly where we left them. As we're leaving the neighborhood and turning onto the main drag to head back to the department, yeah, curb check. I give my partner an annoyed look. I seriously think he did it just to annoy anyone that rode with him. But seconds later, we hear him, oh shit, from the back. I wish I could tell you that it was from her going to be sick, or that she was warning us of what was coming, like maybe shit herself or something. But no, I don't think anything would have prepared me for what I saw when I looked into the back. She'd taken out one of the cheap box knives that had the scored blade that can be easily broken off, and it cut deep into her leg. When we hit the curb, apparently it stabbed and broke. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, blood all over the back seat. I tell my partner to pull over, radio for a bus, and I grab out our little first aid kit. As soon as we pull over and I rip open the door, she starts acting like she had forgotten what she'd just done and tried to pull away from me. After I told her that I have to try and get her bleeding to stop from her self-inflicted stab wound, she sobers up a bit, remembers what happened, and completely panics, seeing the blade in her thigh. I managed to, with what little we had, tape some cardboard onto the blade in hopes it wouldn't cut anyone else, apply a pressure bandage and get it taped. EMS arrives and we transfer her into their care and follow them to the hospital. The rest of the night was spent in ED until she was admitted for a 72 psych hold before being released back to us. Turns out, the box cutter was hidden in her bra and had I done a proper frisk, running my hands past the underwire and up her sternum, I would have found it and avoided this whole mess. And the takeaway, always do a proper search. You just might prevent yourself your partner, or your arrestee from getting hurt. For those that care, she was diagnosed with some mental issues and got the help that she needed. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story of your own to share and you would like me to feature it on the channel, please send it to the email in the description. Or if you prefer, head over to my subreddit, r slash stories from Mr. Revenant. It's the stories that keep the channel going. Thank you all for listening, and thank you to my channel members and patrons. LJ, Fiona X Fox, Scott, 
I Like Booty, Monica Levelace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracard, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zep Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, and Alex. I hope you're all doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.